Prince Igor is an opera in four acts with a prologue, written and composed by Alexander Borodin. The composer adapted the libretto from the ancient Russian epic The Lay of Igor's Host, which recounts the campaign of Rus Prince Igor Sviatoslavich against the invading Cuman tribes in 1185. He also incorporated material drawn from two medieval Kievan chronicles. The opera was left unfinished upon the composer's death in 1887 and was edited and completed by Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov and Alexander Glazunov. It was first performed in St. Petersburg, Russia, in 1890. Composition History Original composition, 1869-1887 After briefly considering Lev Mize the Tsar's Bride as a subject, Borodin began looking for a new project for his first opera. Vladimir Stasov, critic and advisor to the mighty handful, suggested The Lay of Eagle's Host, a 12th-century epic prose poem, and sent Borodin a scenario for a three-act opera on 30 April 1869. Initially, Borodin found the proposition intriguing, but daunting. Your outline is so complete that everything seems clear to me and suits me perfectly. But will I manage to carry out my own task to the end? Bah, as they say here, he who is afraid of the wolf doesn't go into the woods, so I shall give it a try. Alexander Borodin replied to Stasov's proposal after collecting material from literary sources. Borodin began composition in September 1869 with initial versions of Yaroslav Nazariuso and Konchakovna's Cavatina, and sketched the Polovsian dances in March of the Polovsky. He soon began to have doubts and ceased composing. He expressed his misgivings in a letter to his wife. There is too little drama here, and no movement. To me, opera without drama, in the strict sense, is unnatural. This began a period of about four years in which he proceeded no further on Prince Igor, but began diverting materials for the opera into his other works, the Symphony No. 2 in B minor and the collaborative opera Ballet Marda. The Marder project was soon aborted, and Borodin, like the other members of the mighty handful who were involved, see acute S.A.R. Sway, Modest Mussorgsky, and Rimsky Korsakov, thought about ways to recycle the music he contributed. Of the eight numbers he had composed for Act Four of Marder, those that eventually found their way into Prince Igor included No. 1, No. 2, No. 3, no, 4, and no, 8. Borodin returned to Prince Igor in 1874. Inspired by the success of his colleagues Rimsky, Korsakov and Mussorgsky in the staging of their historical operas, The Maid of Pskov and Boris Godunov, this period also marks the creation of two new characters, the deserters Skulla and Yeroshka who have much in common with the rogue monks Valam and Misael in Boris Godunov. In his memoirs, Rimsky Korsakov mentions an 1876 concert at which Borodin's closing chorus was performed. The first public performance of any music from Prince Igor identified by him. Borodin's closing chorus, Glory to the Beautiful Sun, which in the epilogue of the opera extolled Igor's exploits was shifted by the author himself to the prologue of the opera, of which it now forms a part. At present this chorus extols Igor as he starts on his expedition against the Polovsky. The episodes of the solar eclipse, of the parting from Yaroslavna, etc., divided into halves which fringe the entire prologue. In those days this whole middle part was non-existent, and the chorus formed one unbroken number of rather considerable dimensions. Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov, Chronicle of My Musical Life, 1909 The idea of a choral epilogue in the original scenario was no doubt inspired by the example of A Life for the Tsar by Mikhail Glinka, to whose memory Prince Igor is dedicated. Borodin's primary occupation was chemistry, including research and teaching. However, he also spent much time in support of women's causes, much to the consternation of his fellow composers who felt he should devote his time and talent to music. 
In 1876, a frustrated Stasov gave up hope that Borodin would ever finish Prince Igor, and offered his scenario to Rimsky-Korsakov. Rimsky-Korsakov instead assisted Borodin in orchestrating important numbers in preparation for concert performance, for example, the Polovsian dances in 1879. There was no end of waiting for the orchestration of the Polovsian dances, and yet they had been announced and rehearsed by me with the chorus. It was high time to copy out the parts. In despair I heaped reproaches on Borodin. He, too, was none too happy. At last giving up all hope, I offered to help him with the orchestration. Thereupon, he came to my house in the evening, bringing with him the hardly touched score of the Polovsian dances, and the three of us, he, Anatoly Lyadov, and I, took it apart and began to score it in hot haste. To gain time, we wrote in pencil and not in ink. Thus we sat at work until late at night. The finished sheets of the score Borodin covered with liquid gelatine, to keep our pencil marks intact, and in order to have the sheets dry the sooner, he hung them out like washing on lines in my study. Thus the number was ready and passed on to the copyist. The orchestration of the closing chorus I did almost single-handed, Nikolai Rimsky calls that curve, chronicle of my musical life. 1909 Borodin worked on Prince Igor, off and on, for almost 18 years. Posthumous completion and orchestration. 1887-1888 Borodin died suddenly in 1887, leaving Prince Igor incomplete. Rimsky, Korsakov and Stasov went to Borodin's home, collected his scores, and brought them to Rimsky, Korsakov's house. Glazunov and I together sorted all the manuscripts. In the first place there was the unfinished Prince Igor. Certain numbers of the opera, such as the first chorus, the dance of the Polovsky, Yaroslavna's Lament, the recitative and song of Vladimir Galitsky, Konchak's aria, the arias of Konchakovna and Prince Vladimir Igorovich, as well as the closing chorus had been finished and orchestrated by the composer. Much else existed in the form of finished piano sketches, all the rest was in fragmentary rough draft only, while a good deal simply did not exist. For Acts 2 and 3 there was no adequate libretto, no scenario, even, there were only scattered verses and musical sketches or finished numbers that showed no connection between him. The synopsis of these acts I knew full well from talks and discussions with Borodin, although in his projects he had been changing a great deal, striking things out and putting them back again. The smallest bulk of composed music proved to be in Act 3. Glazunov and I settled the matter as follows between us. He was to fill in all the gaps in Act 3 and write down from memory the overture played so often by the composer, while I was to orchestrate, finish composing, and systematize all the rest that had been left unfinished and unorchestrated by Borodin. Nikolai Rimsky calls that curve, chronicle of my musical life. 1909 The often repeated account that Glazunov reconstructed and orchestrated the overture from memory after hearing the composer play it at the piano, is true only in part. The following statement by Glazunov himself clarifies the matter. The overture was composed by me roughly according to Borodin's plan. I took the themes from the corresponding numbers of the opera and was fortunate enough to find the canonic ending of the second subject among the composes sketches. I slightly altered the fanfares for the overture. The bass progression in the middle I found noted down on a scrap of paper, and the combination of the two themes was also discovered among the composer's papers. A few bars at the very end were composed by me. Alexander Glazunov, Memoir, 1891, published in the Ruskaya Musical Naya Gazeta, 1896 Musical Analysis. Central to the opera is the way the Russians are distinguished from the Polovsians through melodic characterization. While Borodin uses features of Russian folk music to represent his compatriots, chromaticism, melismas and apogeturash, among other techniques, are represent their heathen opponents. These methods had already been used by Glinka and others to portray Orientalism in Russian music. Performance History 
During the season of 1888-9 the Directorate of Imperial Theatres began to lead us a fine dance with the production of Prince Igor, which had been finished, published, and forwarded to the proper authorities. We were led by the nose the following season as well, with constant postponements of production for some reason or other. On October 23, 1890, Prince Igor was produced at last, rehearsed fairly well by K. A. Kuchera, as Napravnik had declined the honor of conducting Borodin's opera. Both Glazunov and I were pleased with our orchestration and additions. The cuts later are introduced by the directorate in Act Three of the opera did it considerable harm. The unscrupulousness of the Mariinsky Theatre subsequently went to the length of omitting Act Three altogether. Taken all in all, the opera was a success and attracted ardent admirers, particularly among the younger generation. Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov, Chronicle of My Musical Life, 1909 The world premiere was given in Saint. Petersburg on 4 November 1890 at the Mariinsky Theatre. Set designers were Yanov, Andreev, and Botvarov, while Lev Ivanov was ballet master. Moscow premieres followed later. The first was given in 1892 by the Russian Opera Society, conducted by Yosef Pribik. The Bolshoi Theatre premiere was given in 1898 and was conducted by Ulrich Avranek. Other notable premieres were given in Prague in 1899 and in Paris in 1909, with the Sergei Dyahilev production featuring Fyodor Chelyapin as Galatsky and Maria Nikolaevna Kuznetsova as Yaroslavna. London saw the same production in 1914 conducted by Thomas Beecham, again with Chelyapin as Galatsky. In 1915 the United States premiere took place at the Metropolitan Opera, but staged in Italian and conducted by Giorgio Polacco. The first performance in English was at Covent Garden on 26 July 1919, with Miriam Lysit as Yaroslavna. In January and February 2009 there was a production at the Alto Theatre by the Essen Opera. While some aspects of the production may have been unusual, one critic noted that, placing the dances as a finale is an elegant idea. The director Andrei Sagas and the conductor Noam Zer have thus presented a music and dramaturgically coherent Prince Igor. Heartfelt applause for a worthwhile evening at the opera. In 2011 there was a concert performance in Moscow by Helicon Opera, based on Pavel Lam's reconstruction. A new edition based on 92 surviving manuscripts by Borodin was completed by musicologist Anna Bulicheva and published in 2012. In 2014, the Metropolitan Opera in New York City staged a reconceived version, sung in Russian for the first time there. Director Dmitry Chernyakov and conductor G. Andrea Nozda removed most of the melodies contributed by Rimsky Korsakov and Glazunov, although they retained the composer's orchestrations. They added many fragments by Borodin that Rimsky Korsakov and Glazunov had omitted, basing their work on many decades of musicological research. They rearranged the order in which some of the material appeared, in some cases taking account of notes left by Borodin. The overall conception made the opera more of a psychological drama about Prince Igor and his state of mind. Given the deep depression he went into following his soldiers lost to the Polovsians, the entire opera was reordered. After the prologue, in which the solar eclipse was taken as a bad omen, Act 1 presented a dream sequence dealing with the relation of Igor and his son with the Polovsian general and his daughter in the Polovsian camp. The second act largely dealt with the antics of Prince Galatsky in Puteville and ended with the destruction of the city. The third act ended with Prince Igor coming out of his depression to begin the rebuilding of the destroyed city. This production starred Russian bass Ildar Abdrazakov in the title role with Ukrainian Sopano Oksana Dyka as Yaroslavna. The performances in New York included a worldwide HD broadcast.
The production was jointly produced with the Nederlandse Opera of Amsterdam. At the beginning of the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics in Sochi, Russia, in February 2014, some of Borodin's music from this opera was played while an eclipsed sun, crescent-shaped, drifted across the upper levels of the center of the stadium, showing the basis of Russian history in the Prince Igor story. Publication History, 1885, Three Arias, Piano Vocal Score, Edition by Borodin, W. Bessel, St. Petersburg, 1888, Piano Vocal Score, Edition by Rimsky, Korsak, Hoven, Glaze, Unov, P. Belyayev, Leipzig, 1888, Full Score, Edition by Rimsky, Korsak, Hoven, Glaze, Unov, P. Belyayev, Leipzig, 1953, Piano Vocal Score, Edition by Rimsky, Korsak, Hoven, Glaze, Unov, Moskiz, Moscow, 1954, Full Score, Edition by Rimsky, Korsak, Hoven, Glaze, Unov, Moskiz, Moscow, 2012, Piano Vocal Score, The Original Version, Edited by Bulicheva, Classica 21, Moscow, Royals, Note, the actual given name of the historical Yaroslavna is Yefrosinya. Yaroslavna is a patronymic, meaning, daughter of Yaroslav. Konchakovna's name is similarly derived. Yaroslavna's brother, Vladimir Yaroslavich, is often called Prince Galitsky, leading to the misconception that he was a prince by the name of Galitsky. In fact, he was a son of Prince of Gallic Yaroslav Osmo Mice. Prince Galitsky is a title meaning Prince of Gallic.